things get weird at night, especially for delivery drivers. The door to a strange house may as well be a portal to hell sometimes. The last story is an especially good example of this. If you're delivering while listening to this, please be wary of your surroundings and listen to your gut. Anyway, get cosy and let's get into it, shall we? I, a 22-year-old female, used to do DoorDash on the side for some extra cash. This was in the summer of 2018 when it was newer, or at least in my town it was. Since then, I think they've made many changes, but it was unorganised at the time. If you don't know what DoorDash is, it's like a food delivery service typically for restaurants that don't deliver. Think McDonald's, Taco Bell, etc. Anyways, the one night I was doing deliveries all day, I decided to do my last delivery around 10pm. So I get an order in, and the person wants a medium cheese and pepperoni pizza, and loaded potato wedges from a nearby pizzeria. I wondered why they'd order from a pizzeria that delivers, but I figured it was because this place was notorious for taking forever when you order for delivery. I accepted the order and headed to the pizzeria. I arrived, picked up the pizza, confirmed I had picked everything up on the app and was on my way. The app notified me of the special instructions the customer asked for, which was to call them when I was outside. Okay, nothing unusual there. Lots of people asked for that so they can come out to me. I get to their address and it's downtown. It's a larger apartment building and it's completely pitch black. Instantly, I get an eerie feeling. So when I pull to the curb, I stay in the car and call the number. Hell no, I wasn't about to go near that building. Luckily, DoorDash has this thing that hides your actual phone number. It rings a couple times and this really creepy woman's voice comes on the line and says, we can't get to the phone right now. We're a little tied up, followed by some creepy ass giggling. Meanwhile, the entire time in the background, another woman is screaming, and I mean screaming for help and for her life. It even got louder, as if the creepy woman was purposely putting the phone closer to the screaming woman. I instantly hung up and drove off quickly, not knowing which direction to go. Luckily, there was a super popular restaurant a couple of blocks away. I pulled into their parking lot and pulled up the DoorDash app. I was worried about getting in trouble for not being able to deliver the order, so I contacted the help center and they told me I had to wait 15 minutes to see if they'd call me or message me about their food. Well, they never called, and thank God for that. I'm sitting in this restaurant's parking lot, telling my mum about what happened, and we agree that it is probably a prank. But just in case it isn't, I need to call the police. So I called the non-emergency number and told them everything. The police tell me they would go do a wellness check and actually thanked me for calling them to tell them about it. I went home and nothing ever came of it, but I still think about it from time to time. I got a free pizza and potato wedges though, so that was cool. Creepy lady in the apartment. Let's not meet. And to the lady screaming, I hope you're safe and okay. I deliver pizza and I'd been having a really busy night non-stop back and forth without any time to pause and take a leak. I'd been so busy that I wasn't even thinking about bathroom breaks. We were also going through a heat wave in our area, so I'd been drinking copious amounts of water. Suddenly, as I was driving to this particular delivery, the urge to go hit me, like things went from zero to 60 in an instant. Thankfully, I was close to the customer so I could get this one over with quickly, or so I thought. I pulled up to the house, which was an area I'd delivered in before, so I could immediately see that something wasn't right. All the lights were off in the house, not even the glow of a television or anything. It was extra apparent because the streetlight closest to the door was out of order, and on top of it all, the block was dead quiet. This is a big university area, and obviously there aren't many student renters in July, but there had to be at least one person because someone ordered this pizza. Maybe they just liked sitting in the dark or were out back in the yard, whatever. I didn't want to get out of my car and knock on a quiet house in the middle of the night, around 9.30pm, without first checking that I had the correct address and that the customer was actually inside. It was scorching that night, even after sundown. My car's AC is a joke and the piping hot pizzas don't help much, so I have to try and open the car door as infrequently as possible to keep any cool air in. I called the customer's number, and the voice on the other end was gruff and out of breath, saying, 
Yeah, I kept it clear and concise. Hey, it's your pizza out front, but there doesn't appear to be anybody home. The customer replied, still gasping for air. Yeah, I'm not home. I had to pee so badly by that point that I was much less patient than I'd otherwise be with a customer right out of the gate. Well, then we're going to have to terminate the order because I've arrived in the stated delivery window and you were supposed to pay in cash, so I don't know what to tell you. Plan ahead next time. I instantly regretted letting my bladder do the talking for me. The voice on the other end came through more clearly as a young, bubbly and very distraught girl who couldn't have been older than 20 or 25. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I was running down the street so I could barely hear you. She cried, I just switched you out of my AirPods. Is that better? Sorry, I completely lost track of time at work, but I knew you were coming. That's why I'm literally running home right now. Please don't leave. I'm starving and I don't have a car. Seriously, please don't leave. Five minutes tops, okay? I know what it's like to be hungry, running late and have no car, but not live near any restaurants. Plus, when I heard her voice, I began to remember, more specifically, having delivered to this place a couple times before, and she'd always been perfectly nice. Now I felt bad for snapping at her. I tried to walk it back while simultaneously looking out my window for potential spots to pee. No, no, it's my bad. I'm letting the heat get to me and it's not your fault. No need to rush. See you when you get here. While surveilling the street, I hung up and started to think I was really out of luck. All the other houses had people in them and were close together, so there were no clumps of trees or out-of-the-way patches of land or anything. Of course, I tossed my empty water bottle at the last delivery because I'm an idiot. Finally, I decided it had escalated to an emergency and the safest bet was to use a bush in front of the woman's house. She wasn't home. The streetlight was out, so no one would see me. The people who were home were inside. My car was parked across the street and were a small shop who don't wear uniforms, so if someone did spot me, they'd have no way to connect me to my employer. Animals pee outside all the time. Humans are animals. This is fine. I scurried over to the tallest bush in her front yard. She didn't have much of a yard, just a walkway lined with bushes and flowers that ran adjacent to her front door. The biggest cluster of bushes, the only one where I could be sure there would be no visible splatter on the house, was about four feet from her door. I looked both ways, unzipped, and let fly. After the initial millisecond of relief, I noticed the sound was way off, more like pissing on something solid than something leafy. I started panicking, thinking I'd aimed wrong. But once I start, I can't simply stop midstream, so I kept squinting into the darkness to see if maybe I was hitting a key rock or something and could move a few inches over. Instead, all of a sudden, I heard a way more concerning noise. A deep voice exclaimed, What the fuck? And before I could turn around, assuming I'd been caught by a neighbour, a man came leaping out of the bushes. He blew by me, brushing my golden shower off him as he did. He spat pretty emphatically on the ground, so I think I might have beamed him right in the face. I didn't see where he went after a few paces, but though this next part is a blur, I think I remember hearing a car screech out a bit further away after a minute. By that point, I'd gotten some night vision so I could make out his height, build and outfit, but only the most general details of each. I was so shocked that I didn't even put my dick away. I just stood there trying to figure out what had happened. The reality was so terrifying that my mind refused to accept it and impulsively searched for a reasonable explanation that could make everything okay. I thought, could these bushes lead to some backyard area and just look like they were against the house? Could they have been obscuring an open window? My inner voice desperately screamed, Bruh, that man was wearing a hoodie in 90 degree weather. That was a bad man, you're in a bad situation. But the very idea that I was within inches of a guy who would be hiding in bushes at all let alone in front of a young woman's house at night. That just wasn't something I was ready to grapple with yet. I was coping by not coping. My fight or flight response totally failed me at that point because my dumbass did the absolute last thing I should have done and approached the bushes to try and validate this. There must have been a good reason for a man in a hoodie to be behind these bushes in the middle of the night theory. So I walked over to the side, turned on my phone flashlight and tried to peer around the line of shrubbery. Pro tip, as scary as things may look in the dark, seeing them with a single beam of your flashlight can make it even worse. That's when I saw the bag. There was a tattered drawstring bag sitting behind the bushes, slightly splashed with pee. But I was in such a moronic daze from the shock of the situation that I grabbed around at the bag, thinking, see, this is it. 
This will explain why he was back here. Oh, it explained it all right. Once I manoeuvred it over and pulled it open, I saw a sharp knife, a roll of duct tape and a bottle of pills. The delusions officially broke at that point, and all the adrenaline, endorphins and self-preservation instincts that had been suppressed kicked in ten times over. I became whatever the opposite of dazed is. I was more laser-focused than I had ever been in my life with one singular goal. Get back to my car. I dropped the bag, booked it across the street, got in my car and slammed the pedal to the floor before the door was even all the way closed. I went as far as I could, as fast as I could, until I hit a red signal. Then I pulled off to the side and realised I shouldn't be driving any more than necessary in the condition I was in. I pulled into the parking lot of a 24-hour drugstore and took a breath. I was finally calm and coherent enough to zip up and formulate a plan of action. My first lucid thought was, who do I call first, the police or the girl whose house that was? I thought about it for what couldn't have been more than 10 seconds, but it felt like an hour and decided, okay, I'm in my locked car with the engine running. If trouble starts, I can drive away. I know something's up. She might not. She needs to know not to keep walking in that direction. But as I was dialing her number, it occurred to me, what if there was no girl? I thought I remembered delivering to that house before. But what if I was wrong? What if the girl on the phone was just a decoy to get me there to rob me, or worse? Every pizza guy on the planet has seen the Evil Genius documentary by now, so I thought, she called me all out of breath, she wasn't home, the whole thing was off, can't risk it, I'll start with the cops. I called 911, and the operator was very helpful in keeping me calm because I was a complete wreck. He kept assuring me that someone would be there soon. I kept telling them they had to get there before the girl did. But I was trying to express three thoughts at once, really damaging my credibility. It came out more as, you've got to save this girl because he wasn't after me. I was just delivering a pizza. Unless they actually were after me, in which case there might not even be a girl. But I talked to one on the phone. So then you should find that girl because they used her to lure me there. But if she's real, she doesn't know about the guy, who was also real. And there could be more guys if there's actually a girl. And you know what? Even if there isn't a girl, there might actually be more guys. I only checked one part of the bushes, so I don't actually know. But we'll know which guy is the one I saw because I pissed all over him, you know. I didn't mean to. This was back when I thought the girl was real, but not home, but she might be real, so you really need to find her if she is because the guy was real. You get the idea. Finally, they basically asked me to stop talking and stay on the line. But that was when I saw an incoming call from the customer. I couldn't answer it without disrupting my 911 call, so I ignored it. But then she sent me this text. Hey, I'm here, don't see you? I told 911 she was there, and they said officers were only minutes away. But who knows how long that meant, especially after I'd given such a scattered account of the events in my panic. I felt completely overwhelmed with guilt, because my rational mind said the odds of her being a decoy girl for some giant scam targeting pizza guys were low and the odds of her being the intended victim of a predator were high. So I put my 911 call on mute, where I can hear them, but they can't hear me, and turned back, heart absolutely pounding out of my chest, compulsively muttering, fuck, 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 the entire way. Then I took 911 off mute and told them I had returned to look for the girl. They weren't happy about that, but I saw her meandering past the parked cars in the street, looking to see if one was mine, and I waved her down, flashing my brights. She bounced over to the window of my car, happy-go-lucky. I figured that was a good sign that she wasn't in on whatever this was. But I was just so scared to be back in the general area and to not know what had just happened or what was going to happen. I kept whispering, get in, get in. And she was like, get it, huh? Oh, you want me to get the pizza from the back? I didn't want to make the same mistake with her that I had made with 911. So instead of trying to tell the whole story, I stuck to the bare basic facts. There was a man in your bushes. I'm on the phone with the police. I don't know where he is right now. Please get in the car so we can lock the doors. I could barely get even those sentences out, shaking like I'd had ten cups of black coffee. I held up my phone with 911 on the call screen to verify it for her. I thought that was why she got in the car without further explanation. But it turns out that wasn't entirely it. You still there? Is she with you? Are you safe? Is anyone else there? 911 kept checking in not knowing who the third party I was talking to was. I reassured them and we drove, more cautiously this time, to a location 911 instructed us to wait to speak with police after they cleared the area. I didn't actually have to do much after that. 
The police came pretty soon after. A police car met us. I gave a statement telling them everything I observed, and she went to speak to more officers in more detail than they needed me for. It turns out she got right into a strange pizza guy's car without probing any deeper into my story, because she knew who the man was right away from my description. She had an abusive ex-boyfriend who was apparently psychotic enough that he immediately came to mind from hearing, there's a guy in your bushes. She later called us to thank me and insisted on leaving a huge tip. I wasn't there when the call came in, so the kid who answered didn't know to refuse to accept the money. But the manager already promised the next time we see her, we can load her up with enough one free pie cards to last a lifetime. Easily the scariest thing that has ever happened to me on the job or off. I don't get the chance to tell the story much because I try to avoid sharing it with anyone who could possibly know the girl or know of the event, but I'm still not the same since. Even though I know he didn't have anything to do with me directly, this truly shook me to my core. So, man in the bushes, let's not meet. About two years ago, I worked part-time at a popular pizza chain as a delivery driver. I had a full-time job during the day, so the pizza place shift would be from 6pm to 12pm. I enjoyed the job because it was easy and I made good money, but I hated working at night because it was dangerous. One night we got a call 30 minutes before closing for a delivery in the worst part of town. I was stuck taking the order since my manager sent the other driver home early because it was a slow night. I hurriedly headed out to deliver the pizza. About 20 minutes later, my GPS said I had arrived. I couldn't read the house number as it was pitch dark and none of the houses had their porch lights on. For safety, I called the customer to ask if they could turn on their light. He didn't answer until the sixth ring. He tells me his house has two trash bins next to the curb and that the light is broken, so he can't turn it on. I start walking through the front yard to the front door when I see a man staring at me through the window. I yelled hello to him, but he did not react. He didn't even move to open the door. I'm getting goosebumps now and decide to turn around and return to my car. I call the customer again, telling him to come get his pizza from my car. He tells me in a slow, creepy voice to ignore his roommate. He said the door was unlocked and asked if I could take the pizza to the fucking basement because he rents the bottom floor. While on the phone, I could make out a small light from the window. The man that was staring at me earlier was on the phone talking to me. I hung up and took off. When I returned to the restaurant, phones were turned over. Any complaints would have to wait till the next day. I'm not delivering to any basements and I'm taking your pizza home for dinner. Let's not meet again. Ever. A few years ago, I worked as a driver at a pizza chain in my hometown. I was 27 but made darn good money delivering. I had worked at a few other places, both local and prominent chains in the years before, and I still work as a door dasher on occasion, even after this happened. Now I choose to deliver in much safer areas for this reason. I got luckier than I could ever imagine. One night I was working and had a double, two deliveries to take. Both were cash orders. I had $12 left in my bank. Side note, a bank is what drivers are given to use as change for cash orders, so you don't always have a ton of cash on you. The first order went smoothly. The guy gave me 50 for a $35 order, so I was excited about the nice tip. I drove to the second delivery. It was at an apartment complex with multiple buildings. I had delivered there before. The sun was about to set, but it was still very light out. The chain I worked at had us drive company cars with their logo on them. These cars were all white sedans. And yes, this is an important detail. I grab the order and go to the door of the apartment building. A young guy comes out and a much bigger older guy was outside smoking a cigarette. The big guy went inside as the smaller guy came out. He looked around nervously and asked how much he owed me. The way he was looking around made me very nervous. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. I told him the amount and he said that wasn't what he was told on the phone. Something was very wrong. I felt someone else walk out behind me from the door as the first young guy looked around down the parking lot craning his neck as if he was looking for someone. I told him the amount again and broke down the order for him trying to keep calm. Then the first guy held a gun to my right temple. I also felt a poke on my spine. Two gunmen, I couldn't speak. 
Words wouldn't form no matter how hard I tried. Give me your money and keys now, the first guy growled, and I fumbled immediately for the keys. I gave him my bank but hadn't realised the fifty was mixed in. I gave him the keys trying my best to remain calm. Another guy came up from my left. He had poofy hair and was around the same age as the first kid. I hadn't seen the one behind me yet. Poofy hair grabbed the pizza bag, then ran off and hid. The first kid searched my company car. Luckily for me, I had left my wallet in my personal car. I saw him grab my cell phone. That's when the panic began to set in. I had pictures on that phone that I hadn't backed up of my then five-year-old son, who absolutely is my world. Please, please don't take that. I have pictures of my son who died on there. It's all I have of him, please. I lied. My son is very much alive. The kid behind me spoke softly. Trust me, just listen to him. You'll get it back undamaged. I don't want to be here either. I could tell he'd been crying by how his voice sounded. A car began pulling in, and the three boys took off to the other end of the complex in a full sprint. Before the one behind me ran, he dropped the gun in front of me. Standard issue 9mm in silver and black, safety off, looked completely real to me. He picked it back up and ran with the others. The car that pulled in saw me. It was a woman and her kid. Panic set in as I realised they could very easily come back and do way worse to me as the sky started to get dark. I collapsed. They had taken my company car keys, $72, the pizza and my phone. The woman ran up to me and asked if I was all right. She took me into her apartment in the next building over and locked the door. I was shaking so hard I couldn't even hold her phone to talk to 911 as she set down her kid. Her boyfriend, I assume, helped me call. I spoke to the operator and told her everything. I'm colourblind and these guys wore all black and white clothes, thank God. I had a complete description of two of them. The poor woman who helped me was going to be late for work, but she still stayed until I was off the phone and the cops showed up. Man, she was harsh and blunt with the operator. But I will never forget this woman's utter kindness to me, nor her boyfriend's. Cops showed up and contacted my store and my manager brought out the spare keys for me to drive the car back to the store. After dealing with the cops, I drove back and was greeted by my crying and beyond worried co-workers. All of them were terrified that I was hurt. It meant a lot to me how much they cared, but I told them I was fine. After dealing with the cops, I drove back and was greeted by my crying and beyond worried co-workers. All of them were terrified that I was hurt. It meant a lot to me how much they cared, but I told them I was fine. I filed the proper paperwork and the $72 was written off as a loss to the store. Thank God for that. I had worked at other stores that make you pay back the money out of pocket if you get robbed, to prevent drivers from stealing. I was told by the owner to take the rest of the night off and take care of myself. He gave me a hug. To this day, he is one of the best bosses I ever had. What I didn't know was, I was in for a very long night. I called my best friend from the store phone before I left the store and asked where he was. We usually meet up for drinks after work. He was around the corner at a bar, so I met up with him. His dad was a District 4 cop in my city at the time, which is the same district all of this happened in. He told me his dad had given him a heads up, and he had two shots waiting for me to calm my nerves. After the two shots, we began playing pool when his dad called his phone and asked if I was with him yet. He said, yeah, and handed me the phone. His dad then asked if I could come to the station. I was honest and told him I'd had two shots, so he sent out a squad car to get me since it wasn't that far away. We got to the station and they had suspects in custody. I needed to ID them. Three boys and a driver. They had been caught less than 20 minutes after the robbery, speeding. The bolo had already gone out and they matched the description. They used the money they stole from me to buy weed and gas and had taken off. They had at least 15 stolen cell phones on them one of which was used to place the order at my store. My phone was in the mix in the box. The police told me to grab my phone only, and I did. Then they asked me to unlock it. It had fingerprint verification, so that was easy. Nine of the ten tries to unlock it had already been used, so if they had tried once more, my phone would have been completely reset. It unlocked. I told the police every detail yet again, although my parental instincts kicked in. I told them the guy behind me quite obviously was bullied into this and to show mercy. He was the one with the white shirt. The police went wide-eyed and told me he was the one talking. The other three denied involvement. That's when I found out about the fourth guy, the driver. We found out later he was completely unaware of the robbery. 
and was just picking up his friends. He was never charged. The boy behind me and the one who grabbed the pizza were 15 and 16 and got six months of house arrest. The only reason the one behind me got off easy despite having the gun to my back was because I asked them to go easy on him. He was a good kid who didn't want to be there and was the only one confessing. Makes sense because he had even said the other guy wouldn't have the phone for long. He was planning on going to the cops had they not been caught. But the other guy, the first kid who put the gun to my temple, it was his 18th birthday and he got the book thrown at him. In the courtroom, he made fun of me and laughed at me. Seeing him made me panic. The judge scolded him for his behavior and he just grinned and glared at me with a joker-like grin. All I could see was pure evil. This kid would definitely commit more crimes. I had no doubt he would eventually end someone's life. You could see how cold he was just by looking into his eyes. He's evil incarnate. I grew up in a town full of murders and abusers, but I'd never seen this kind of evil in my life and I never wanted to see it again. I asked to remain anonymous and have my name stricken from the records in case he ever got out. I'm so glad I did because today I got a letter from the state. He's being released next month. The court only had my old address, my parents' house, and my mum didn't think the letter was important. I had missed the deadline to protest his release from probation. The plea deal was eight years, it's only been four. He's getting out early due to overcrowding of all things. Not good behaviour, but overcrowding. Next month. I'm ready if he finds me. My wife, parents and everyone I know knows his face and name. If he tries anything, we're all ready. But for his sake, let's not meet. To the woman and her family who helped me, if you see this, please know my undying gratitude for you all. It was inconvenient for you, yet you still were late to work to help me and I cannot thank you enough. I hope your beautiful baby girl is doing well too. I would gladly meet you again to give you the proper thanks you deserve from the Domino's driver in Southwest Ohio. Do you have scary stories you'd like to hear told? Send me an email at nocturnalreveries at proton.me. I will be sure to credit you. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell for more tales, both true and imagined. Until we meet again, I've been Basil, and you've been lovely. Thank you for watching and we'll see you again soon. Good night.